um, hers because what I'm going to be talking about are the steps that happen before the actual impact assessment study begins. So I will just bring my screen up. So once again, if um, any of the participants have any questions um, from the first presentation, you can put these in the chat and we'll keep an eye on them and we'll come to them um, at the end of um, the first half of our morning. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yes, Helen. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, great. That's sure. Didn't want to um, think. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about screening, scoping, and commissioning. Now, Julie has provided an introduction and um, some really good starting points for all three of these steps, which basically are the ones that must be conducted before the HIA actually starts. So it's setting the HIA in motion. So when I'm talking about screening, I'll be talking about the steps that you need to go through to identify if there is actually a need to do a heritage impact assessment, because not all projects will require this. The scoping part, very simply put, is to define the focus and scope of the heritage impact assessment. I'll be going into much more detail of this. That is just a very, very, very short definition. And finally, commissioning. It often involves tendering and awarding of the heritage impact assessment contract. So that means who the people, the team who is going to conduct the heritage impact assessment are uh, put in place and able to begin. So screening. So this involves a review of project proposals to identify those which may have a potential to impact on heritage resources. These projects will require a heritage impact assessment. Now, most countries um, have some sort of environmental impact assessment legislation and regulations. Now, I put environmental impact assessment because many countries do not have specific heritage impact assessment regulations. Now, I've put this in here uh, in the general environmental impact assessment uh, system because it's still the same system that the HIA will work under. So we can use that to understand how the HIA will be put into place. So these regulations and legislation um, will often specify different categories of actions, actions meaning the result of a development that are, will require assessment. Now, obviously, for World Heritage Properties, uh, the OUV may be affected by a proposed project, then it's going to require an HIA. Now, I just would like to add that what I'm discussing, and as well as what Julie's discussing, um, can also be applied to other types of heritage, as you saw in her description of baseline. When we do heritage impact assessments, we're not always focusing on World Heritage. So if anyone is actually required to do a heritage impact assessment on something that doesn't fall into world heritage, the same system is actually uh, in place. So an understanding of doing that um, is also available. So in some cases um, in the EIA system, the screening is automatically applied to certain types of projects, uh, very, very expensive projects and covering a large area. The reason these are automatically put into a uh, environmental impact assessment um, category will be that it is thought that they will cause significant effects to some aspect of the environment. Now, this doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be heritage, but it does mean an, impact, an environmental impact assessment is going to be required and it has to be determined if heritage is going to be part of that. Um, also, sometimes proposals in specific development sectors, such as power generation, mining, forestry, or agriculture, that are known to have quite significant environmental impacts, are also categorized as a type of project that will require impact assessment. Now, with respect specifically to heritage, 
proposals located in the vicinity of known heritage sites. Now, these projects can be large, small, there is no categorization of the type or the scale of the project. These, if there is um, an effect, a potential effect to heritage, then these projects will require a heritage impact assessment. And obviously with respect to a world heritage, um, if they possibly potentially will affect the OUV, they need to be screened to identify. Now, Julie um, went through this yesterday, so I won't spend a lot of time um, going through the actual types of projects, but these are some types of projects. And just what I would like to highlight is you'll see the first three categories, transport, public and utility infrastructure. These are often um, implemented by governments. They are um, official projects uh, in that sense. And that means that the heritage impact assessment, so the heritage side, heritage authority, heritage practitioners are gonna have to build a relationship with another government department who is responsible for these infrastructure projects. That's very important to remember, and I will come back to um, information sharing and collaboration as a very, very important part of HIA. And as I said, I'm speaking about the steps that lead up to an HIA. So we're not talking about doing the actual HIA. We're talking about how this HIA will be implemented effectively. And at the very earliest stage, we have to have good communication. Uh, the bottom private developments, of course, um, residential, a lot, obviously many are tourism related because heritage uh, areas often attract tourists. So um, businesses, commercial enterprises relating to tourism are often proposed in the vicinity of uh, heritage sites. Also commercial shops, restaurants, factories, processing plants. There are many, many, many different types of developments that we have to keep in mind. So screening specifically to World Heritage properties, um, as we've said, this again screening is looking at whether a heritage impact assessment needs to be conducted. It's not looking at how it will be conducted, the details of it, that comes later. This is just looking at is the heritage impact assessment necessary or is it not? So first of all, what you have to do is identify if heritage resources will be affected and if the affected resources contribute to the OUV and how they contribute to the OUV. So will the changes brought about by the development impact on the attributes that contribute to the OUV? So both of these things have to be looked at at the start to determine if a heritage impact assessment is going to take place. And again, as I mentioned in the last slide, consultation with all relevant parties, having good lines of communication at the very, very, very earliest stage is very important going forward. And finally, remembering, always remembering that a project that affects a World Heritage property isn't necessarily inside the property or the buffer zone. Uh, we can't say this enough because certainly uh, the developers project proponents themselves will often see their project as being outside of the World Heritage property. And they will often say, well, it's outside of the buffer zone as well. Why would this affect your World Heritage property? And as the screening person who is um, determining whether this project will affect the World Heritage property. This has to be clearly understood and be able to be conveyed to the developer project proponent. Now, once we have decided that a project does need an HIA, so it has been screened, and as I said, sometimes it can be screened out. It is decided the project doesn't. But going forward, if a project does require an HIA, our next step is scoping. So what is scoping? Well, basically, it's, um, it is looking at, as I said, the focus of the HIA. It's looking exactly what needs to be included in that HIA to make it effective. 
Now, again, terminology, there are many different, um, every country will have a different term. Sometimes you will see a scoping report. Sometimes it's called a study brief. Sometimes it's called a terms of reference, a TOR. All of these things are basically the same. They're just different terms. And they all need to have the same um, information included. Uh, though I will say um, in some cases, if it is guided by legislation, there may be very specific things that are required in a scoping report. Um, but in general, we'll just uh, look at this as being uh, all being sort of on the same page. So I will refer to it as a scoping report in this presentation, uh, just for the sake of simplicity. Um, as I've said, uh, all stakeholders need to be involved in the scoping process. So at the screening process, in the very, very, very original start of the decision-making process, we looked at who needs to be involved. So we should already know at this point who these people are. They would include the Heritage Authority, project proponent, other relevant government departments, as well as interested and effective parties. Now this can be the local community, this can be public interest groups. We have to look at everybody who has, um, who may be affected by this um, either um, directly or indirectly. Now that does not mean to say that people's opinions, like everybody can have a different opinion and everyone is of course entitled to an opinion. It does not mean that these opinions will necessarily affect the uh, scoping of the report. It is more to gather information so that the scoping team, when they put the scoping report together, will have all the necessary information to understand what needs to go into that report. So in a formal EIA system, the project proponent is most often responsible for preparing the scoping report. Now, obviously a project proponent, a developer does not have heritage knowledge, any specialist knowledge at all. So the project proponent will often um, engage a heritage specialist to um, assist them in that aspect. And also, as I've said before, there should be input from uh, all of the above uh, interested parties. I mean, that also includes heritage authority. So it's an integrated process that involves many different things. But at saying this in the formal EIA system, the project proponent is the responsible party. That means they have to um, provide the finances, the manpower for producing this report. But the report will have to be approved by the Heritage Authority. So it doesn't mean that the project proponent can put together whatever um, they find you know, is in their own best interest. They have to put together a scoping report um, that is able to be approved by the Heritage Authority. Uh, Heritage authorities can also prepare scoping reports. Um, then of course they would need input from the, the project proponent. Um, it's all a bit of a back and forth uh, thing with um, at that stage. So a good scoping report um, basically aims to reduce the amount of work required in the later stages. If everything is put in place prior to the commencement of the actual study, if the people conducting the heritage impact assessment know what is expected of them before they start, the more information they have, the better they will be able to uh, do their work. So at the scoping stage, these are some of the things that need to be decided. Um, this is not all inclusive. This is just some of the general things so that we have a, a good idea. Now the study area, um, we've talked about study areas quite a bit uh, yesterday and um, also Julie's mentioned. So the study area does not include just the footprint of the development. Um, and again, as the person scoping out um, the, study area for the heritage impact assessment, you have to have a really good understanding of the heritage resources and also the project. Because the project proponent, the developer is not going to understand um, you know, what kind of a study area is needed. The heritage uh, component, the heritage person 
putting together this scoping report for heritage needs to be able to explain why this study area maybe, you know, as I have said in this sentence, um, visual impacts can have a study area as large as 10 kilometers, depending on um, air quality and how far um, things can be observed in the distance. But we have to be able to um, base this study area on the information required. So a study area is not uh, just a general uh, distance that can be applied to uh, projects uh, without looking at them individually. Every project has to be looked at individually and a study area determined for that project that is tailored to meet the needs of both the heritage resources and also the expected impacts from the project. So also at the scoping stage, the methodology needs to be clearly stated. Now, Julie's just given a very, very comprehensive talk about baseline information requirements. So at the scoping stage, what we want to know is what information already exists. We are not going to do the baseline study, but we are just going to see what information is available. And the reason we do that is so we can determine what additional work is gonna be required as part of the heritage impact assessment. So this can mean background research. Um, as Julie said, sometimes we have to look at um, uh, old photographs or maps, maybe some other types of background research, or maybe some initial research needs to be done. Also for um, survey and assessment techniques. If we have a study area that has many archeological sites that um, we don't have information on, then we might have to go and do a survey to determine if all of the um, sites that are in our study area have been identified. And we won't necessarily be able to identify every site from our survey, but we can also identify areas of archeological potential. And again, one of the reasons we're doing this at this stage is so we can explain to, um, well, not explain, so that everybody has a clear understanding at the start, what is gonna be involved in the heritage impact assessment and the tasks that are gonna be required um, to provide an, an effective report. So we have to have some sufficient information to conduct the assessment. So again, archeological historical research additions might need to be done, site visits, archeological survey. So the next thing we need to do is think about critical impacts. So at the scoping stage, we are not looking at trying to identify every single impact that could happen from a development. We are looking at significant critical impacts and we want to flag up key issues. And we also want to identify any elements of a project that aren't relevant. We don't want to include in our um, impact assessment things that don't need to be included. We don't want to make extra work for no reason. So as I said, um, the critical impacts key issues are flagged up at this point. They will be looked into in much more detail and of course other impacts also during the assessment. But at this point, we just want to have a high level look at potential impacts. And again, as I've said, stakeholder con consultation, uh, very, very important. You need to look at the organizations, people, local community, who needs to be consulted. Um, all of these stakeholders should be able to have a say at an early stage. This can help in designing um, ways to mitigate later on in the project that um, if information isn't shared at an early stage, if things are already a done deal, if things have been decided, if you do a consultation, people do not feel that they have any input into, into the project because the decisions have already been made. So it's very important to start your consultation when decisions still can be affected, when people still can have input. And finally, the scoping stage needs to determine what expertise, what is your HIA team? Who do you need on that team? Um, if you're looking at an archeological area, um, 
you might need a person who specializes in pre prehistoric archaeology, or you might need somebody who specializes in historic archaeology. It's very, very specific sometimes, the expertise that's needed on these projects. So the scoping report itself, uh, Julie ran through this um, quite comprehensively yesterday, so I won't spend too much time uh, on it, but um, this is taken from a formal EIA system. So these, this example, uh, but um, obviously this can also be applied to HIA. So what should the scoping report include? Well, an, an executive summary, Obviously not everybody is gonna have time to read the scoping report or to be honest, uh, have uh, the time or inclination to read your HIA report. So it's really important to have a clear and concise executive summary um, of your findings. So also the context of the projects, um, that means the objectives, the need for the project. This is something that's very important because if the project is not needed, if there's no, if it can't be justified, um, the, then the project probably shouldn't happen at all. So we need to, you need to look at this in the context of policies and plans and also uh, local and regional communities that will be affected. Um, an overview of the policy, legal and in institutional framework, the project description and alternatives. Alternatives are very important. You need to have alternatives before the uh, actual impact assessment starts. I will go on to that in a little more detail in a minute. Um, description of the environment, um, key, those critical impacts, so key potential environmental heritage impacts in our case, and also potential, are they able to be mitigated? It doesn't mean that you go into your mitigation measures in detail, it's just, have you identified uh, impacts that cannot be mitigated, then the project cannot go ahead. So again, public consultation and disclosure, we should have a transparent environment. We don't want to be secretive or look like things are being done behind people's back. Uh, transparency is very important. And finally, the conclusions and recommendations. Um, a lot of people will um, maybe just read A and H, the executive summary and the conclusions and recommendations. So you want to make sure you've done a good job with those. So, in brief, a successful scoping report will be agreed by all relevant government parties. Okay, so again, the information has to be shared. It is a collaborative effort to get a successful uh, impact assessment going and a successful impact assessment is obviously going to reflect on um, the success of the project as well. So this includes government and that's all government departments. If it is a road project, you know, the transport department needs to be involved. The transport department uh, needs to understand how their project is going to um, affect heritage or if it is going to affect heritage. So the heritage managers and local communities, we, um, I can't, uh, emphasize enough the importance of transparency and um, moving forward. So also we want to ensure early agreement. Again, so all of the parties have an understanding of the requirements. You don't want surprises halfway through the project when um, you have a, a draft HIA or you're asked to come up with some uh, impacts during your assessment um, study and some of the parties who are involved in the project are surprised. They have never heard of this information. We need to have this all stated clearly at the very start. And also what heritage will be affected by the project. So it's just being comprehensive. So also remember that the heritage impact assessment, it is something that should be proactive to remove and reduce impacts before they occur. It is never, ever, ever a good thing if a heritage impact assessment is put in place to react to an impact after it's occurred. Yeah, uh, heritage impact assessments, no impact assessment is designed to look back and fix things. It's designed to look ahead. So again, I just wanna emphasize that it is really, really, really important that the heritage impact assessment is put in place and the proper um, procedures for the heritage impact assessment are put in place at the earliest possible stage. 
now just briefly projects where the assessment will include world heritage properties what do we need to include specifically uh, in these scoping reports well we need to have a description of the world heritage property and a statement of the outstanding universal value preliminary identification of the attributes that convey OUV and other values where change may affect the OUV of a world heritage property, the threat risk to world heritage status must be taken into consideration. So also need to identify if the project is located within the property buffer zone or outside. Because as I've mentioned before, the actual location of the uh, development can vary quite, quite a bit. It, it doesn't necessarily even have to be adjacent to the buffer zone. It can be some distance away. So an HIA is not necessarily going to be additional to EIA requirements, but if an HIA is conducted under an EIA system, the methodology must focus on OUV and attributes that convey that OUV. If the HIA does not focus on these attributes, it will not meet the standard standards for managing change in World Heritage properties. And as I've said before, um, alternatives, alternatives to um, the development need to also be put in place. And for World Heritage properties, uh, these include a no-go option. No-go options aren't always included in uh, scoping reports. What a no-go option is means that what impacts, what would exist if the project did not happen. So this can be compared to what will happen if the project goes ahead. So very briefly, I'm going to run through these because Julie um, took you through these yesterday, so I don't think I need to spend too much time on them. So um, what as aspects of the project need to be described? The main points here are the, for the location of the development site, uh, include a map. Um, I often use, use Google Earth to provide an aerial. Um, we want to have a really good um, map, plan, aerial photograph of the location. We want to be able to understand where the location of the development site is and also what the situation of it is. And aerial photographs from, from Google, Google Earth are a great way of doing this. So also uh, the number of structures, maximum height, so ground area covered, permanent and temporary. Now I will add at this point, you probably won't have a lot of details. So you can just provide in the scoping report the details that are available at that point. Later on, more details will be provided. But for instance, uh, temporary access roads for construction. The uh, project proponent might say, um, we don't know where the temporary access roads are going to go yet. Yeah, we'll probably need them, but we don't know where they're going to be. Uh, that doesn't matter. So you still need to include in the scoping report that temporary access roads are going to be um, included in the assessment. Because if you don't put that in the scoping report, they might be left out at a later point. It might be found out that the temporary access roads do not cause any significant impacts, but we have to have all of that information available prior to the um, uh, implementation of the HIA so that it can be conducted uh, properly. Also for similar things for permanent roads for the operation, landscaping and planting, you're probably not gonna have any details at all about this, but these issues need to be flagged up if they have the potential to um, affect uh, heritage. And also again, associated infrastructure, uh, is your development going to be requiring electricity to be brought to your site? There are all kinds of uh, different infrastructures that might be required. Also include a statement to show what aspects of the project may affect heritage sites and why. So this is a, a clear statement so that anyone who reads it can understand uh, exactly what the project may affect. Again, we're not saying how it's going to affect it, the level it's going to affect it, but just the potential effect it may have and the reason why it has to be included in the impact assessment. I mean, for example, um, an excavation for a uh, foundation of a building can damage or destroy an archaeological site. A tall structure can cause visual impacts to visually sensitive heritage sites. It's very, it's very um, simple, simple wording, but it also clearly conveys uh, what needs to be included. 
So issue two, how is a study area um, determined? Again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because this has been discussed quite a bit, but obviously the study area needs to include, it needs to be big enough so that you can get all the information you need to conduct your assessment. This might be a small study area. It might be a very large study area. It doesn't matter that, um, you know, that it, it's the size of it in that respect. What matters is that it's big enough that you can gather all of your information. Indirect impacts, they can cover really large areas. And it also depends on what kind of heritage resources are being affected. Visual impacts are probably the largest. They can um, affect uh, very, very large areas. Um, I think as I had in an earlier slide, you know, some visual impact assessments can be up to 10 kilometers from the actual development. Other impacts may be very localized. Direct impacts from the development through ground disturbance obviously can destroy an archeological site. But again, you have to remember to understand the effects of that you have to look at that archaeological site in its context in a larger area. So that might mean that your study area goes quite a bit beyond the boundaries of that archaeological site. Um, approach and methodology. Um, again, we need to establish the data and information requirements needed to undertake the HIA. Things like, do we need to do surveys? Will we need to um, go out and do test pitting? Will we need to do pho photographs? Will we need to do written documentation? Also defining which heritage features uh, will be included in the HIA. Again, as Julie mentioned, you know, the legal status. Um, are the heritage um, so resources being affected? Are they world heritage? Are they national level? Are they regional, local? Is there any legal protection? Are they graded? Are they scheduled? Also state what the likely impacts are. Are we looking at direct impacts, indirect, and clearly state what they are. A direct impact, a potential impact, you know, archaeology sites have the potential to be destroyed by this project. Very straightforward. And finally, the expertise required to undertake the HIA. What does the HIA team need? Now, I just will spend a little bit of time on this because providing alternative options, this is something that's often overlooked um, or maybe not enough time is spent on looking alternative options in uh, HIA sometimes. In a formal EIA system, if alternatives are not provided, the project can be rejected. Uh, there was a case of this in Hong Kong a number of years ago. It was for a prison and the uh, Department of Corrections looked at one site had the EIA system, it had an EIA conducted for this site, went to the environmental protection, to the uh, government body that approves or rejects uh, your EIA, and it was rejected because they had not looked at any other locations for their prison site. For no other reason, it wasn't that the EIA was done improperly, nothing. It was simply because there were no alternatives provided. So the purpose of requiring alternatives is to ensure a comprehensive process has been undertaken to reduce and avoid significant negative impacts from the earliest stage of a proposed development. You're not gonna be as effective if you start looking at alternatives halfway through your project. Um, this is never going to be a good outcome for your project or for the impact of resources. So when we talk about alternatives, there are a number of different things that we mean by that. So first of all, it can be an activity. If uh, your project involves waste disposal, you need to get, you have rubbish and it needs to be um, disposed of. Your project may look at, your, your alternatives may be a landfill versus an incinerator. Yeah, so even at this early stage, you will be looking at different, how different activities will affect um, resources will impact on resources and maybe one or the other will be chosen. So also design, reducing height, choosing appropriate color scheme and building materials, layout, changing the locations of different components. If you have a large site, you may be moving some buildings um, to a part of the site where they're less visible or will have lower impact. And finally, location which I think is what most people think of when um, we say alternative options, they think, oh, well, they're gonna move the, um, move the project somewhere else. 
So this could be for a whole or a part of a project, um, and it could be close by, or it could be far away. So viable, all of the viable options. So if any options are not um, gotten rid of at this uh, early stage, they need to be included and assessed in the HIA. So the scoping report must present and explain what alternatives have been looked at and how they have been designed to minimize the impact. So as a heritage, um, scoping for heritage, you would have to look at the different alternatives and um, see at this point if any of them would have unacceptable um, impacts or also if all of the alternatives um, would require a full impact assessment. So the review of alternatives um, should provide an explanation of how the project has come to be in its current form. So this can include if uh, alternate site locations and designs were looked at and also uh, if any have been looked at and they have all been rejected. So when it comes down to um, your proposal, you may only have one location, but you still need to show that you looked at other locations and found them not to be acceptable. And that is why that location has been chosen. Finally, commissioning. So commissioning is the act of deploying an expert team to conduct an impact assessment. So we have lots of uh, different specialists who can be on the team, just some photographs of different uh, people who might be included in a team. So who does this commissioning? It can be done directly by heritage and authorities. Um, it's really important if it is done by the heritage authorities that the managers and staff who approve the HIA team and also if they are um, approving screening or any other aspect, they're properly trained to ensure they can do their jobs effectively. Funding agencies, ADB, WB, Asia Development Bank, World Bank, um, yes, they can also commission. So if they do, the HIA team still has to be approved by the Heritage Authority. So the funding agency cannot pull someone um, out of the woodwork and say they're doing my uh, HIA, they have to be approved by a uh, heritage authority. So these people are often professional consultants. They can also be hired by the project proponent. And in some cases, not in all, um, the people chosen, uh, the project proponent can go to the heritage authority and be provided with a list of approved professionals who have the right, you know, the correct certification and experience. So sometimes this is issued by a heritage authority or possibly um, it's just approved individually. Um, one thing I will say is that everybody who's involved in the heritage uh, impact assessment team has to provide a full and comprehensive CV to uh, show why they are qualified for the job. So just a few little uh, notes here and we'll almost be finished. The commissioned uh, expert team, they obviously they must have the appropriate qualifications and experience and this will be reflected in their CV. Uh, one thing that the team must be allowed is full access to the information required. So at the scoping stage, everybody involved understands what the HIA team needs. So that means the project proponent needs to provide all of the information that the HIA team has said they need. The, the Heritage Authority provides information. Um, this can include access if the uh, scoping report says this is our study area and we need access. They have to find out if they can have access. And as Julie mentioned, um, in the real world, sometimes all of the information that, um, you know, ideally we would want to, to have isn't available or sometimes full access isn't available. And that's the gap in information. And that has to be um, noted as well. But that obviously would come at a later stage. So the scoping report will have provided the tasks required to complete the HIA, the outputs and the timeframes. The budgeting for the HIA will be based on this information. So this final bit is um, directed at the commissioning, which means the people who are hired. So obviously they're uh, doing a job, they're being paid to um, undertake the HIA and it has to be budgeted for. Um, not in all, but in some cases uh, in the EIA system, there's a competitive tendering process. Um, 
it's really important to remember that expertise and manpower should also be considered when hiring an HIA team and the lowest bid is not necessarily going to uh, be able to provide uh, adequate service and uh, bids that cannot complete the brief should be rejected. So to just to end things, um, why are screening and scoping important? Well, briefly, to ensure that all projects that will affect heritage are identified at the earliest possible stage. This is the best way to ensure the optimal outcome for heritage. Adding an HIA in the later stages of development often results in a less than optimal outcome for heritage. There are many examples of this. Uh, I won't go into uh, the details of those, but I'm sure everybody has come across such a case. Um, adding an HIA at a later stage is also costly for the project proponent if it changes to design layout and location are required or the project or parts of the project are rejected. So basically what they do is they provide all the information necessary to ensure that a qualified team can be commissioned to undertake the HIA and the best possible results for heritage will come about. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you.